but thank you very much for, for joining us um, today. Um, I should just say to those uh, attending, um, because we've got so many, uh, you'll not be visible or aud audible um, during the, uh, this uh, webinar. You can raise questions. Uh, if you do that through the Q&A function um, at the bottom of the screen, uh, we will gather those up and um, relay some of those questions uh, at the end of the presentations. Uh, we will also gather them up later and uh, see if we can summarize them in the written report of the webinar that we will um, put online later together with, uh, with, with the recording of this. We've also got today um, captions running uh, so that uh, anybody who has difficulty hearing, you should be able to see uh, the text at the bottom of your screen um, in captions. Um, so this is, uh, we're co-hosting this. I'm Hugh Whistle, Director of the Nuffield Council on Bioethics. Uh, we look at ethical issues arising from developments in biological and medical research. Uh, there are a number of challenges that arise from what's happening with uh, coronavirus and COVID-19 that uh, we want to uh, open up and think about and examine. Um, today, um, we're co-hosting this with our uh, friends and colleagues at the Ada Lovelace Institute. Uh, Carly Kind, director of, uh, of the Institute, is, is with us and we'll, uh, I'll hand over to her in a moment. Um, one of the big questions at the moment is how we move from the current state of uh, lockdown, as it's uh, uh, often referred to, um, towards what looks a little bit more like normal life and what kind of uh, data-driven technologies might assist in moving towards that and what some of the issues might be around that, uh, including questions about uh, privacy and what kind of stage processes this might, might lead to. Um, this will have to be done in ways that are open, clear and will inspire public trust. Um, still re leaves a lot of questions. We've, I'm delighted that we've got um, uh, Lynette Taylor, who's in the Netherlands, uh, and in particular, uh, Rupang Lee in Wuhan in China, uh, where they've experienced uh, some of these issues a little way ahead of the rest of us. But first, I'd just like to hand over to uh, Carly Kind from the Ada Lovelace Institute, um, who are more specifically focused on questions of data and AI, um, not just in COVID, but more generally, and give us an idea, Carly, of the kind of issues that you think uh, it would be useful to flesh out today. Thanks. Thanks, Hugh. So, uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, I hope you are all keeping well in these difficult times. Uh, the Ada Lovelace Institute is a research institute with a remit to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. And um, we have been spending the last two weeks doing a rapid evidence review on the technical considerations and societal implications of using technology as part of the transition from the current crisis. So we know that in many countries around the world, governments are considering how they might be able to use technology to understand the disease, um, the coronavirus disease, to begin to understand its spread and to stop its spread and to uh, rebuild the capacity of health systems and of our societies more generally as we move out of strictest lockdown measures. And there are different technologies under consideration. Um, there in particular, and those which have um, received the most amount of attention in the media, are uh, digital contact tracing applications, uh, symptom tracking applications. And, um, and we're really at the start of the conversation on this, immunity certification. And uh, in that context, there is some discussion about digital immunity certification uh, technologies. And the Ada Lovelace Institute has decided to do a review of the evidence surrounding these types of technologies and an initial scoping of what the societal implications of their deployment might be. We've commissioned a group of, uh, well, we brought together a group of 20 or so experts last week on a, uh, a workshop to discuss these and we've drafted a report which will be published on Monday, which is called Exit Through the App Store, question um, mark, and really looking at should we be using technology to transition out of this crisis and if so, how we should use technology to ensure that it has the, um, the optimal benefits for society and to minimise any risks 
and negative implications. And out of that review comes a number of findings and I, I won't go into them now because I want to hear from the speakers just like you do, but I think the chief one is at this stage we feel there's no, there is not sufficient evidence to support the widespread rollout of digital contact tracing. In particular, there are a number of technical limitations to various proposals on the table, as well as deep social risks of deploying digital contact tracing um, uh, um, as such that it warrants some pause in current plans, at least here in the UK, um, to roll out digital contact tracing technologies. We also find that the um, evidence on immunity testing is not yet at a uh, position or um, at a, has met the threshold to warrant any widespread regime of immunity certification that might rely on immunity testing. And in general, we call for uh, more transparency from government, um, a greater wider range of perspectives being fed into government decision making, a culture of working in the open, and more accountability mechanisms before these new technologies are deployed as part of the transition from the crisis. I'll stop there and um, I'll hand back to Hugh who will introduce our first speaker. Um, we will be publishing our report on Monday and I look forward to sharing it with you all then. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Carly. <clears throat> I won't take um, too much time uh, introducing the speakers. You can see details in the, uh, um, the, the, the registration uh, pages on the, on the website. Uh, so, but first we'd just like to hear from Lynette Taylor Associate Professor at uh, Tilburg uh, Law School in the uh, Netherlands. Lynette. Thanks very much um, and welcome everyone on the call. Um, I think the reason I was asked to participate today is because I work on a project called Global Data Justice where we try to figure out what uh, ethics-based and social justice-based framework for governing data worldwide would look like. So what we try to do is look at how data technologies are playing out in different places and how the data that goes into them comes out of them is affecting society. So based on that, my point of view on the topic for today is that we're in a situation where we're seeing a lot of policy-based evidence emerging rather than evidence-based policy. This is because we're working in a state of profound uncertainty with very thin knowledge of the accuracy of the data that we have to work with. I think this is true for epidemiologists, for policymakers, for the mathematicians doing modeling, it's a very tough time for everybody to draw conclusions that they can really stand behind. We're seeing scientists be fairly balanced and clear about that, but we're seeing that when stuff gets translated into policy, there are radically different effects around the world. And that's something we can learn from right now. Um, I think when we add data analytics, whether in the form of trying to do identification of people who are thought to be immune or when we're doing contact tracing, when we're using any kind of app or data analytics service for something that has huge implications for our civil and political rights. The kind of analysis the Ada Lovelace Institute has been doing is really important to, to place front and center. This is because cultural differences around the world are gonna create different kinds of evidence which governments are going to have to weigh. And the diversity question is really important here. So for instance, we're seeing already face masks are believed to be radically more effective in some places in the world than others. This is not true. There is some kind of underlying truth about whether we should all be using face masks. We don't know what that is right now, um, but it's affecting policy. Also extreme forms of social control exerted partly through technological surveillance, as we've seen, for instance, in China, um, will show that that has an effect whether it's the kind of effect we want to adopt is a question we need to be really judicious in thinking about. Um, proxies for calculating infection risk, you know, how far you are from somebody who's thought to be infected, how much time you spend around somebody who's thought to be infected, are really problematic right now. If we adopt apps that use those proxies, they will definitely have an effect. We shouldn't confuse that with being right or accurate or solving the problem. Because as the epidemiologists are saying, this is not a problem that can be solved. This is a state of the world which needs to be addressed in a continuing way. So in a way, we're talking about governance of the entire problem rather than solving anything. So the things we know about this. First is that any tech right now cannot really be described as meaningfully accountable on a democratic level. This is problematic everywhere in the world. 
we haven't built a culture of keeping technology accountable. We've built a culture of exponential growth in technology industries and pumping money into the sector to create innovation. This is fantastic for economic growth. It's not so great when we want to place <laughs> our health and our civil and political liberties potentially in the hands of technology developers. It's very important not to do that. We want to avoid a hackathon approach to this, which is what we're currently seeing, I would say. Every research group in the world doing tech has, particularly computer science, obviously, and engineering, has piled into this problem. Some of them are producing brilliant ideas. Some of them are not. For all of them, the data is inadequate. and We need to bear that in mind. They're working with the same data everybody else is. So if we want to make government through technology, which is, I think, what we're talking about right now, accountable and safe, we need to do several things. First, we need to be honest about the gaps in the data in an ongoing way. What do we know? What do we not know? And we need to be transparent about that. What mechanisms do we have for making sure that things are not being built based on inaccurate data or data which has become understood as inaccurate since the tech was built? Second, we have a history of function creep and security theater. Back when we could get on planes, we had to do a lot of things like taking our shoes off, you know, which were responding to previous emergencies, but didn't actually have any relevance to the current state of affairs in terms of security. It's very likely we're going to see this happen with apps and with tech in general in, in this crisis. Having stable technological ways to address this problem is going to become a way to manipulate people's perceptions of the safety of going out of the house, of going back to work, of letting their kids go to school. It's really important that the kind of provisions for accountability that the Ada Lovelace Institute is asking for should become concrete. Third, I think we need to complement structuring our actions through technology with structuring of protections. We don't have structured protections against irresponsible technology right now. We have data protection. It's not enough. Data protection aims at personal data. A lot of the technologies we're talking about right now are not completely to do with personal data. They're to do with the larger group issues of civil and political liberties. And we need to be clear about which we're thinking about and whether we're addressing both of those levels. Personal data is not enough here. Um, so we need checks and balances where we have a meaningful role of civil society organizations in protecting privacy, civil and political rights, and also in ensuring representation. This is another thing that Ada Lovelace Institute has, has stipulated, is that we need actual representation, representation of different groups in the governing of these technologies, which we don't have currently. Policymakers make policy in their own image a lot of the time. We see lockdown, isolation, even hand washing being demanded of populations around the world who don't have the opportunity to do that. We see a lot of talk about smartphones when we know that 50% of the world doesn't have one. And if they did, they wouldn't have the connectivity to use it. So we know that some solutions will work some places, others will work other places, and we need to be conscious of that. Finally, I think we need to balance this problem of centralization and decentralization, because good privacy technology, good privacy preserving technology decentralizes data. It keeps it on your phone. It keeps it away from central authorities. Good government does the opposite. It centralizes good information with government and allows government to act judiciously to solve problems. This is going to be a conflict and we're going to need organizations that can broker between those who need information centralized and those who need it to be decentralized to protect us. This is going to be a political problem that we live with over the long term with regard to epidemiology. And so I'm interested to see what we can do about that. And finally, that no tech solution should be seen as a political solution to anything. We remain in a state of vulnerability no matter what we do. And the idea that tech can actually realistically protect us is something more dangerous than bad politics or bad government, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lynette. Um, uh, we're picking up some questions already. Thank you very much for that. We'll gather them up, uh, some of them to, uh, a little bit later. But first, can I um, ask um, uh, Rupeng Lee, um, yeah. Bioethics, um, at uh, Hua Zhong University in Wuhan. Ripeng, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to have uh, this chance to communicate with uh, so many audience, you know, online, in the online meeting. But, you know, uh, what a pity, I just had an operation. 
and uh, on Tuesday, and I still uh, still in hospital, so video communication is not convenient for me. So I just you know uh, to uh, for this audio uh, communication. So uh, this uh, uh, many thanks for the chair and for the uh, very enlightening uh, talk and presentation given by uh, Lynette. So uh, because I'm uh, in Wuhan, so uh, I I just want to share some you know except appearances uh, uh, in Wuhan. Uh, we, we, we got through uh, from this very tight lockdown. And uh, uh, re regarding this uh, uh, topic of this uh, online meeting, so I'd like to share some uh, experiences and uh, uh, status quo of a health code in China. And uh, then uh, give some uh, preliminary uh, thinking on uh, ethical issues with by. Uh, so firstly, uh, this is a status quo uh, of health code in China. So it was said that the COVID-19 epidemic has been basically controlled in China. Meanwhile, the work production and schooling have to begin to be restarted and the revival of human normal life and the national economy is greatly expected by so many, you know, Chinese uh, people. So at this moment, an invention and its products have been widely used. Uh, on February 6, a leader of Hua, uh, Hangzhou city uh, located in Zhejiang province proposed that in order to help enterprise to restart work with playing to advantages of its digital economy to establish a unified digital declaration platform, including personal electronic health codes, and timely data sharing. And soon after the intervention, CCTV News featured the Zhejiang Health Code, a product of working together by Alibaba company and local government, a new type of public-private cooperation. And so all, all the provinces soon wanted their uh, own uh, version. And uh, the health code uh, in China this is uh, in the information collection stage of the health code. It requires the user to declare the real information, including name, sex, mobile phone number, ID number, detailed address, activity track, health information, contact history, and so on. In addition to the information reported by users, the health code system is also connected with the traffic data of civil aviation, railway, highway, as well as the traffic data within the city, such as buses, subways, and also data of telecom operator and the payment date data or bank. Uh, the use of the data through real-time comparison, update, and comprehensive analysis of big data can cross-verify the information declared by users, accurately grasp the movement uh, trajectory of citizens and accurately identify high-risk groups. So uh, the health code in China featured at different colors. Now we have three colors. Those with green colors are able to travel freely and the yellow codes should self-quarantine for a week, while red codes must spend two weeks at home. So enforcement varies dramatically by region and uh, uh, even uh, neighborhood because till now we don't have a unified uh, health code in the country. Uh, and also with this uh, uh, health code for different city and also has a, a kind of uh, one day pass for whom has green code and the temperature check normal. <laughs> Uh, and you, when you enter into, for example, a supermarket or a hospital, so you, this is uh, uh, the health code plus is a one day pass. So it's, uh, you know, it's uh, varied in different uh, provinces. And actually, uh, health code, you know, now applied in China has its legal basis. The law on the prevention and the control of infectious diseases and the regulations on public health emergencies stipulate that in the process of epidemic prevention and control, the government, the Department of Health, 
FEC and healthcare institutions have the power to collect personal information for the purpose of epidemic prevention and control. Individuals have the obligation to report personal information such as ID card, address, health status, contact history, uh, and so on. And the relevant department and agencies have the legal basis to change the purpose of information use. So uh, mm, I just read uh, the published paper by Michael Parker on this topic. Uh, it is, uh, uh, I think, uh, till now, this kind of uh, mobile phone uh, APPs are highly uh, success, uh, successful, uh, in, not just in China, I think in East Asia and uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, with this kind of uh, APPs and combined with uh, intensive testing programs. So I think uh, these uh, uh, data-driven technologies have its uh, merits, you know, together with this uh, quarantine and isolation contact tracing is effective measures to delay the epidemic. Uh, it's different from standard contact tracing uh, measures. Uh, it's kind of this kind of rapid and uh, instantaneous uh, uh, contact tracing. Uh, because this is a, a problem for this COVID-19 pandemic. Because it's, uh, for contact tracing, uh, it's difficult. Around 50% of transmission happened early in infection and before symptoms start and before test results can be acted on. So I think uh, this kind of uh, uh, emerging technology has its uh, uh, merits. And uh, uh, in Wuhan till now, uh, no new suspected cases and no existing suspected cases. And also the whole city after this tight uh, sitting off and lockdown is gradually and steadily restarted uh, in, in uh, for example, you know, public transportation and, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, uh, production and, uh, and so on. So I think, you know, uh, this kind of uh, technology have its uh, merits, but uh, till now this is a potential uh, threat uh, emerging. Uh, it's an asymptomatic infection. Uh, and uh, according to the uh, statistics, till uh, April 15, a total of 1,032 uh, asymptomatic infected patients are still under medical observations. So this is supposed a new, uh, uh, it's a potential uh, threat for this uh, control and prevention of this uh, uh, COVID-19. So uh, this uh, technology, I think, uh, has its merits and also uh, some ethical issues uh, raised by. Uh, someone said, uh, maybe asked or doubted, is it a sword of the uh, that Merkley's hanging over my head? So uh, for me and my colleagues, it is a little bit troublesome, but it is not. Uh, sword. So what are issues, uh, in my opinion, informed consent and privacy are seriously connected by uh, concern by Chinese public. According to a survey, 16 health codes in 14 provinces are, and cities at the time when the user applies health code, there is no user agreement and privacy policy except Shanghai, Shandong, and Guizhou. For the National Health Code, National Government Service Platform, the applicant is required to click to express consent to the user service agreement and privacy policy when registering, in which it is clearly specified that which information will be used, only used for inquiring users' health information concerning the epidemic prevention, and it declares to strictly protect your personal information safety and not permit to use the information in health code to do activities to invade uh, privacy. But after the outbreak, Shanghai officials said the health code will be used by Shanghai residents to provide 
data services for their work, life, and business. Alipay also said health code will be formally associated with Hangzhou Electronic Social Security Card and Health Card and can directly achieve registration, number, medical treatment, medicine, electronic invoice, and other hospital treatment and medical insurance payment. This raises concerns about the invasion of uh, privacy. So uh, I think the major ethical issues is how to balance between personal interests and uh, social good. Uh, that's a popular uh, uh, a cartoon uh, in Chinese social media now is uh, human right versus human left. Our answer is we do need human rights and we will definitely prevent human life. The health code offers the potential for important benefit to both society and to individuals, offering the possibility of both reducing the number of infectious cases and also enabling people to continue their lives in an informed, safe, and socially responsible way. There is a room for it to be improved, to implement informed consent and protect privacy. We are very glad to know Apple and Google will cooperate to make efforts towards this direction. We believe maybe they, uh, in the future, uh, will be susceptible to keep uh, balance between the personal interest and social good. And so in a uh, pandemic, everybody is possibly a victim and a uh, vector both. I think uh, we need to uh, make this kind of balance in you know, uh, different uh, contexts and different situations. And also how to interpret and uh, um, specify the uh, fundamental uh, uh, basic uh, uh, principles and uh, some you know, uh, normatively uh, uh, basic rights need to how to interpret and uh, uh, to specify in different uh, contexts and especially in this kind of uh, you know global pandemic crisis and we can draw from it a normative claim everybody has a right to be protected and treated when being infected and also has the obligation to protect others including providing your health and other related information to the agency for preventing and controlling the epidemic. In Chinese regulations, there are articles which try to keep balance between personal interest and social good uh, because of time limits. So uh, I will not re repeat the specific uh, article in this kind of uh, regulation. But now I think the problem is how to improve health code and how to uh, keep the balance between personal interest and social good. It's not an easy job. And, uh, uh, and also uh, I, I, I read you know, this broadly and deeply reflect on this kind of uh, very complicated and highly controversial issues. For example, the uh, policy brief briefing uh, by uh, the Ada Lovelace uh, Institute. It's a uh, uh, very deeply and broadly uh, reflection. And I think, you know, uh, the, the state should accelerate the formulation and implementation of relevant technical standards, unify and standardize data collection, use and sharing, strengthen data scrutiny management, prevent data leakage, and publicize relevant standard documents in a timely manner. And each health code operating institution shall improve the user agreement and the privacy policy to guarantee the right of users to be informed and use the data legally and ethically to avoid data abuse. I think that's a, a urgent task in, in, in China because now we are using, uh, widely using this uh, technology. And after the outbreak is over, a data deletion mechanism should be established. If it is really necessary to continue using relevant data, the purpose of data use should be clearly defined and citizens' authorization should be obtained. So uh, uh, 
so much for this. This is uh, just uh, to share some experience in China and uh, some preliminary thinking on uh, ethical issues raised by this uh, uh, data-driven technology. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Ruping. And um, I think we've got some questions we'll want to pick up, but can I just, um, um, on the last point that you made, which was about how important it will be um, for uh, data to be deleted once we have passed the crisis, and Lynette referred to the risk of function creep um, a little bit earlier. Um, I wonder whether, uh, Lynette, you think that this is maybe one of the uh, real risks that we have, uh, is whether the um, governance systems um, that we may be able to put in place will be capable of um, avoiding that continued um, subsequent use of these kind of, not just the data, but also the mechanisms that are used to manage it? I think that's a great question. I mean, the GDPR yeah. for us Europeans does have provisions about getting rid of data when it's no longer necessary. Um, for large companies which have to report what they're doing with data, those are usually followed. Uh, the degree of non-compliance for the GDPR is believed to be very high on the level of infractions. Yeah. So I think we should assume that we'll see that happening with this kind of tech as well. Something else that I have a question about is anonymization is currently equated with deletion. You will see in a lot of documentation data deleted or anonymized. In the case of the kind of data we're talking about, these two things are radically different. Anonymous data can be aggregated data, it can be data that says things about groups, about neighborhoods, about particular ethnicities, about particular sexualities. It can be gender that it can sorry, it can be data that says things about gender, about poverty status, about activities, all sorts of things can be done with data that do not involve identifying people. So once you've anonymized data, which is anyway a moving target, technically, that data can be kept forever under current rules. Nowhere in the world does anyone say you have to actually literally delete data. They only say you have to anonymize it. So I'd be really cautious about that. Uh, thank you. Um, Carly, are there um, particular questions that you've seen that <coughs> you think uh, for us to relay at this moment? Definitely, and I'll, I'll just um, add a quick addendum to what Lynette said, which is um, uh, complicating that. We, in, in doing the research we have done, we've spoken to public health professionals as well about the notion of a mandatory time period after which data co collected during the crisis would have to be deleted, because I agree with Lynette that there is very little yeah. to um, require the deletion of all data, but only if it's anonymization. We did have some feedback from public health professionals that um, the, the use of data for research over the long term may be incredibly valuable. Um, how can we balance the need to retain data for research purposes, um, given that we assume that this crisis is many years in, in, in operation, uh, against more stricter uh, controls on data deletion after a certain period of time? I, that's still an open question as, as far as I can see. Um, I have a, I've collated some of, some of the questions. I'm going to start with Rupang. To, there's a few questions that came up in the chat and also in my own mind around the effectiveness of the health code system. And in particular, um, Andrew Strait pointed out on the chat that Chinese smartphone penetration is at around 51% in recent years. How does the smart uh, the health code system deal with people who don't have smartphones? How does it deal with children? How does it deal with the elderly? Um, and, uh, and have you seen yet any studies or evaluations of the effectiveness of the system? Or is it the case that there is a general perception that the system is very effective, but we don't yet have the research to prove it? Yeah, uh, I got it. Uh, I think uh, till now, uh, you, you know, this is uh, <laughs> this is a uh, outbreak of the COVID-19. So I think uh, we don't have this kind of uh, thorough, you know, investigation and it is sure. kind of, uh, yeah. But I think now in China, I, I just mentioned it's now no unified uh, national health code. This mm -hmm. has a code for different uh, cities. 
and uh, that's not j just this uh, one version for you know uh, uh, travel and uh, you know for civil aviation and for public transportation and uh, this is a plus I, I, I won't call it you know plus you know, house code and plus it's a kind of uh, another kind of uh, it not in electronic version a certificate it's a kind mm -hmm. of local residential community and a hospital certificate mm -hmm. because you know uh, uh I, I i got you know the two version of this kind of uh, certificate you know this uh, house code and also you know you can apply for a uh, local residential community and hospital certificate and this kind of certificate relying on a uh, daily reporting system because you know every uh, citizens you know in this uh, community residential community this is uh, daily reporting your temperature and you know your health status you know to the community uh, uh, mm, uh, 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 officers because you know this is very different you know in China you know, from Western society we have very uh, strong uh, how to say strong or maybe this is a community uh, system you know we have this uh, they can you know to uh, uh, every uh, you know uh, the every resident can be uh, you know uh, trees and uh, report it uh, include in this reporting system and uh, I think this is uh, you know not just one version for this electronic version, because for the, some elderly and they cannot, you know, use Alipay and use WeChat, you can uh, apply for this uh, kind of uh, paper certificate with the uh, mm -hmm. official stamp. And that's also work. So mm -hmm. I think that's the situation in China. It's not but just the one, yeah, version. That's, that's really interesting and it shows how yeah. technology yeah. can build on, but also has to be embedded on social structures. I, I want and to you know, in, 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 uh, it's so very different social structure and in every mm. community, residential community, and also, for example, you know, uh, I'm in Huadu University of Science and Technology, and we also have, you know, our university community, and it's kind of a daily reporting system. So mm. that's, just, uh, you know, it's just a very different uh, social yeah. structure, you know, yeah. That's very interesting. Um, Linda, there's a number of questions that I think are directed at you. A, a thread that is across many of them, including from questions from T Tessa Derbyshire, Maeve Walsh and Gail Cardew, which is centers on trust. How can we build public trust in the technologies, uh, in the government's use of data, including in modeling, um, and in the use of, uh, of health data, I suppose, in these types of apps? That, um, it, are there particular kind of recommendations you have on that front? Yeah, obviously this is a huge question. I mean, trust doesn't come without trustworthiness for one thing. Um, so demonstrating that privacy enhancing technologies have been used wherever possible is a really important first step. But I think there's another issue here, which is that we're asking tech to be part of government and we're asking government to make decisions about tech on our behalf in a way that hasn't happened, at least in recent history. Um, this is different from e-government, right? This is, this is life and death for a lot of people. So I think what we need to start doing is seeing tech as something we should take control of the way we try to take control of government. I think that we should start applying some of the same structures for accountability and transparency that we have for government, however effective those are, and we definitely need to make them more effective, to tech as well. Um, which is something completely new because tech has until now, as I said earlier, been pretty much out there on its own innovating. This is a case where not all tech, but tech that is now part of government and part of governance needs to become under democratic control. And how we do that is a learning process. And I think that the Ada Lovelace report is a great starting point. But I think we need to demand actual legitimacy of technology firms when they act on behalf of government on the population. And that's a completely new framing. Thank you. And building on that, a question from Richard Pinch was, how can we transfer, transform and potentially building on the discussion around deletion, if an, an immense amount of value could be created through the collection of data during this crisis, that value could be 
uh, transformed into commercial value for companies in the long term, or it could be transformed into public value for societies. Um, how can we think about that? Um, I, either uh, preventing the commercialization of data or realizing yeah. the public value of data collected. I think everyone on this call is making sense about how there's no single answer to any of these questions. There's, these are contextual questions. And that what we need is meaningful structures for scrutiny of decision making around these problems. Um, we don't currently have that. And so the questions we're asking are not great questions. We're asking, should we do this or that? Should we build this or that? I don't think we ask that in other, in other areas of life. I don't think we ask, should we build this type of hospital or that type of hospital? We try to see what kind of illnesses people are coming down with and then we respond to that by building our medical infrastructure. I think we need to ask similar questions of our technological infrastructure. We need to ask, what do we know about these data sets that we didn't know when they were created? What kind of scrutiny does decision making about them now require? What kind of power does the data confer? Who should get access to it? It's not rocket science, we're just not used to doing it. So we need to develop ways to do it. And we need new governmental infrastructure to do that, including civil society connections to government that don't currently exist. We need new forms of scrutiny and new levels of scrutiny. And we need a new diversity of scrutiny as well. And I think that is one of the challenges we're coming up against right now in a state of emergency when it's really hard to do that. So it's going to require concerted effort. Is, is there a parallel discussion in China um, on this question of uh, scrutiny and everything? This kind of commercial use of this uh, personal data? Yeah, I think that's a concern in China because this is, uh, now we have, uh, you know, uh, a national platform and also this is the Alipay platform and also WeChat platform can apply for, uh, voluntarily apply for this uh, health code. But this is a kind of uh, new kind of uh, public-private cooperation. So I think, yeah, that's a really a concern we should take into account. This kind of how to protect this is, uh, you know, uh, personal privacy and personal data for uh, maybe the future commercial uh, use. Yeah. Uh, so that's why, you know, uh, in the last, uh, the, the last point, you know, I, I, I mentioned, you know, this of the, how to improve this is, uh, uh, technology, this is emerging technologies. So, but, you know, this is the, maybe is some, uh, dilemmas and some, you know, difficulties can be overcome by technology itself, but, um, we cannot, you know, to rely on this kind of uh, technical fix uh, to social problem, we should be alert about it. And uh, we need some, you know, transdisciplinary experts, you know, uh, to establish this uh, accountability mechanisms to oversight this kind of, uh, you know, the use of these uh, technologies. Thank, thank you. Um, Carly, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm going to, um, on our behalf, wrap up now. Um, I've, we've launched a, a poll, um, if anybody, if anybody is still listening, um, please respond to that poll <clears throat> to give us a little bit feedback and uh, an indication of what we might do next. Uh, I would just like to thank uh, very much indeed uh, my co-host Carly, um, our speakers Lynette um, in the Netherlands, Rupeng in uh, China. Thank you all for listening in. Um, hopefully we'll be back in a fortnight with a, um, another uh, a thrilling episode. Um, this is difficult times and I think it's just really important that we keep going, uh, probing some of these questions um, and this is all happening in real time. So uh, thanks once again to everybody and uh, hopefully see you again soon. Thank you. <laughs>